on episode 650 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Jennifer Mann and Carden Raven and discuss their book, The Secret Language of the Body, Regulate Your Nervous System, Heal Your Body, and Free Your Mind. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 650. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Coach Allen. I'm an NASM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, performance enhancement, and fitness nutrition. A Precision Nutrition Level 1 coach, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA Level 2 online trainer. Each week, I'm joined by our co-host, Coach Rachel. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hey, Raz, how are you? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I've had a, a good weekend visiting with family. Uh, my daughter was able to come over. You know, most of my aunts and uncles are here, and my dad and all, all my siblings are here, and then all our kids. So it's it's been a pretty cool weekend. Awesome. That sounds how are, so wonderful. How are things up there? Good, good. Today is actually our anniversary. My husband, Mike, and I, we are celebrating 29 years of being married. Congratulations. Yep. So I don't know what we're going to do. Just go out, have a nice dinner somewhere. We'll just celebrate. And then my focus is right back on my daughter's wedding, which is this weekend. So (laughs) lots to celebrate with our family. Absolutely. Well, good for Mm -hmm. you. All right. You ready to talk about the secret language of the body? Sure. Our guests today are co-authors of the book, The Secret Language of the Body. Jennifer is a mind-body practitioner, yoga instructor, and functional movement therapist, and has battled severe chronic fatigue. She began researching alternative approaches to healing chronic fatigue and was able to completely recover using trauma-informed mind-body healing. She now leads a community of over 100,000 followers on Instagram and is a co-founder of Chronic Fatigue School which has helped thousands of people from all over the world regulate their nervous systems. Cardin is a nervous system medicine practitioner and an expert in the field of trauma and psychosychological disorders. Over the last 15 years, he has combined principles of body work, brain retraining, and somatic trauma therapies to help thousands of clients across the globe heal from pain and illness. He is the co-founder of CFS School and a regular contributor to Bessel van der Kolk's Trauma Research Foundation. He has led programming for the Wounded Warrior Project, Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, and Starbucks. With no further ado, here is Jennifer and Carden. Carden, Jennifer, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. When I saw the book, The Secret Language of the Body, Regulate Your Nervous System, Heal Your Body, Free Your Mind, I was like, yes, I'm so glad someone wrote this book because (laughs) I've been talking about the body and how we treat it and how we talk to it and what we feed it and how all of these things are messaging the information that the body's taking in and based on what it based on our past based on where we are today physically it's processing that information and making decisions for us that often go against our own health and our own wellness and until we kind of get a grip on this language of how we can communicate to our body it's really hard to heal. It's really hard to lose weight. A lot of the ailments that we're dealing with, when, particularly when we're over 40, they're just an accumulation of this stuff that's been going on and on and on. So I'm really happy to have you on here today. Thank you so much. So the first area I wanted to get into is, like I said, I think if we can make the body feel safe, meaning we're giving it good nutrition, we're moving it well, we're managing stress, we're sleeping well, and we're being kinder to ourselves. you know, that voice back there that likes to call us bad things and doesn't talk to us like our best friend. But once we start taking care of some of those things and our body starts feeling safe, it's in a position to heal. Can you talk about why it's important for us to feel safe, our body to feel safe? Sure can. So we like to say that the nervous system, it's got one mission. 
your brain and nervous system is there to ensure your survival. And another way of saying that is to keep you safe. And it's evaluating everything at all times along this 100 million year old binary of safe or unsafe, safe or unsafe, safe or unsafe. And it's making these determinations every single moment of our life. And it's both making them in terms of our external world, like relationships. Is that a snake or is that a stick? Right. Uh, deadlines. You know, do I have enough money? And it's also doing that internally. Is this food that I just ate safe or unsafe? Is this benign pollen that I just inhaled safe or unsafe? Um, is my own heart rate, these sensations I'm getting inside my body, are these safe or unsafe? So when we say that the most important determination that your brain and body are trying to determine at all times is whether you're safe or unsafe, we're, we're not being sarcastic or there's no hyperbole there. That's that's what it's doing. And I want to back up just a moment ago. You talked so skillfully about how when we start feeding our body correctly, when we start nourishing it, when we start giving it its sleep, when we start treating it kindly, we get so many benefits. And if it's still feeling unsafe, because of an accumulation of chronic stress or trauma or other issues from the past or just like it's in burnout, you can be giving it all of these good things, but it may still perceive itself as unsafe. Yeah. I was just going to add a little personal anecdote to that last thing that Carden said. When I was sick with chronic fatigue syndrome, a lot of the things that I heard after many months of um, diagnoses and, you know, bad prognosis and the doctors were telling me, sleep, rest, eat, don't eat that, don't eat this, but eat and rest and sleep. And I did that for two years and nothing changed. <laughs> and I took so many supplements and I did so many different things. And ultimately, my body was stuck in a state of survival, perceiving itself and the external environment, like light, sound. So I had light sensitivity, sound sensitivity as extremely unsafe. So my body was really in a state of nervous system dysregulation, as we call it. Um, so, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about yeah. how that works, because the theory you brought forward you, that you talked about was called the polyvagal theory. And this deals with the vagal nerve. I appreciate you putting that in the book because this is probably the first time I've really souped to nuts. Just let's read talk about it. How it works, right? So I'm I'm very interested <laughs> in this. Yeah, amazing. Okay, <laughs> I love the vagus nerve. I love the polyvagal theory. So the vagus nerve is an amazing network that allows our brain and our body to communicate at all times, and it has so many nerve fibers, that it is such a strong and powerful tool once we know what it does, how to influence it, and where its baseline is at, essentially. So our vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, and anatomically speaking, it descends from our brainstem down on either side of our neck and down through the jugular foramen, and then down the neck, it innervates as it goes down the neck, the ear section, the neck, our pharynx, our voice box, and then it goes down and it innervates most and all of our vital organs. And what the vagus nerve does is it gives a the input of parasympathetic response. So essentially, when the vagus nerve is stimulated, it releases, it triggers the release of acetylcholine. And this allows the receptors, for example, the muscarinic receptors on the heart to slow the heart rate down. And it allows the digestive tract to contract in peristalsis. So the vagus nerve is this powerful nerve that allows our internal organs and to enter a state of rest, recovery, and digest. But it's it doesn't do it, you know, it's not that it's stimulated and then we're just resting and recovering for, I don't know, hours. It's a, a balance, a delicate balance between the parasympathetic nervous system, which is 
the role of the vagus nerve and the sympathetic nervous system. So the vagus nerve is this powerful um, nerve that essentially has the power to regulate our physiology and namely connected, interconnected with that, our emotions and the experiences that we've had in our past and how they play into our organs and our body and our actions and everything around that, our health. And so the polyvagal theory is the theory by which this vagus nerve plays this important role, not just in on our physiology, like literally modulating our heart rate variability, which we can talk about in a minute, but it has this powerful role on our emotional state, on the state of stress in our body, on the state of not being able to recover from stress. And so that's why looking at the body through the lens of the polyvagal theory is so powerful because it gives us a lot of understanding on why a history of chronic stress, whether that be physical, physiological, meaning a history of viruses or bacteria or psychological, a buildup of chronic stress. And that impacts the role of the vagus nerve because now it's not able to fire its messages of parasympathetic response anymore because there's no balance in the body. So the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic really become off balance. Alan, we can keep talking about this and go down into the polyvagal theory. I did want to nerd out about one thing because, Alan, I was listening to some previous episodes and I've heard about, you know, your past of going near burnout, right? Mm -hmm. Or just being in that like yeah. achievement over work mode. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all relate to when it comes to the muscles in our body that kind of use it, use it or lose it phenomenon. People don't realize that the same thing comes to your nervous system, folks, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need to use your parasympathetic, that rest, digest, recovery, safety system, or you lose it. And that's a lot of what Jen is illustrating, that this vagus nerve, this thing that's responsible for regulating your heart rate and belly and peristalsis, all this stuff, if you're in constant go, 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 go mode, that nerve itself, its activity begins to atrophy. And your capacity to recover plummets because the nerve, it's kind of like if it just says, I don't know what to do anymore because no one uses me. And a lot of the polyvagal theory and vagal therapies that uh, Jen is so good at instructing are about waking this nerve's activity up again and remarkable things happen in the physiology. But yeah, it basically goes dark if you've been in that endless sympathetic mode. It's use it or lose it, but in the nervous system. This episode is sponsored by AquaTrue. I've had the pleasure of having one of the AquaTrue Carafe Countertop Reverse Osmosis Water Purifiers for the past month, and I love it. You know, clean drinking water is a big deal for my wife and I and our dogs living in Panama. But did you know that the Environmental Working Group research shows that three out of four homes in America have harmful contaminants in its tap water? And now you have a way to fix that. AquaTrue purifiers use a four-stage reverse osmosis purification process, and their countertop purifiers work with no installation or plumbing. It removes 15 times more contaminants than ordinary pitcher filters and are specifically designed to combat chemicals like PFAS, or forever chemicals, in your water supply. AquaTrue's proprietary purification technology is independently tested by the IAPMO to NSF and ANSI standards to remove over 80% of the most harmful contaminants, including chlorine, fluorine, arsenic, PAAS, nitrate, and many more. The filters are affordable and long-lasting. No changing filters every two to three months. AquaTrue filters last from six months to two years. Just one set of filters from their classic purifier makes the equivalent of 4,500 bottles of water. That's less than three cents a bottle. Plus, you'll save the environment from tons of plastic waste. That's a big deal when you live on an island like we do. AquaTrue comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and even makes a great gift. Today, you can receive 20% off AquaTrue purifiers. Go to AquaTrue.com, that's A-Q-U-A-T-R-U.com, and enter the code 40PLUS at checkout. 
That's 20% off any AquaTrue water purifier when you go to AquaTrue.com and use the promo code 40PLUS. The thing I like the best that we just put my mind around is, okay, you know, if you get nervous, your heart rate goes up. I think you guys talked about a job interview and like your heart rate goes up, you feel a little queasy in your stomach and that's the physical manifestation of that moment of stress, but that's your body's fight or flight preparing mm-hmm. it to act. Mm-hmm. And so things tone down. To survive. And we, yeah, to survive. To and survive. if you do a little bit of work, just a little, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, you can bring that back down and basically be able to manage it, that stress so much better that your performance is not impacted. Because if we get too nervous, sometimes it is. But this is just an opportunity for us to practice a little bit of control. And the interesting thing, when you were talking through, all, when we went into this in the book, I was like, okay, well, this is not all in our mind. And in fact, many of the exercises that you would do are physical exercises. They're not just, you know, some of them are, but a lot of them are, are physical. And so I think that's a really huge connection that we'll get to in a, in a minute. But I want to jump into a term called heart rate variability. They've got these smart watches and rings and everything now that are giving us this information. And I don't know how many people actually know how to use that. I mean, it's like, it'll tell us how well we slept and we'll get a sleep number. We'll get this number and we'll get these numbers and you want them to be better, but <laughs> Why? What is better yeah. and how do we do that? So can we talk a little bit about heart rate variability? We sure can. I was just going to, you know, a lot of people think that heart rate variability and kind of your heart rate are similar things, like when they take your blood pressure and they're not forever separate them. Heart rate variability, the most important rate there is variability is the measurement of the time and space between heartbeats. And also the time and space that it takes to adapt to go up and down. And in fact, in general, the higher your variability, meaning the more dynamic, the more sort of modulating, not rhythmic. We want rhythmic heart rate, but heart rate variability, we want to see move and change and modulate a lot. And what we've seen in the research is people who have been under chronic levels of stress or who have been stuck in that survival mode that we were speaking about, their heart rates lose their variability. They look very flat and boring and uninteresting. And when you see a variability indicator like that, it is directly reflective of where that polyvagal system is and how, remember how Jen talked about that balance? It's not just, you don't want to just be parasympathetic folks all the time. Okay. We don't want to, we don't want to just be lounging or chilling. Right. But we also don't want to be in endless fight or flight achiever die mode. And heart rate variability is one of these beautiful, easily measurable windows into is your nervous system and your entire physiology capable of oscillating between these states of sympathetic and parasympathetic of act of activation and deactivation smoothly or gracefully and with that that's why it's such a key measure and what regulates and modulates heart rate variability it's the vagus nerve so the vagus nerve literally innervates the sinoatrial node and it speaks to this node that contracts that initiates the contraction of the atria the upper atria of the heart and initiates the heart beat so if the vagus nerve's tone is low then the parasympathetic response of the heart is going to be low as well and instead it's going to be driven towards fast heart rate high heart rate and essentially lower cardiovascular health so high heart rate variability is associated with great cardiovascular health and this it's really the variation that is so important between the heart the heart beats and low heart rate variability is low vagal tone meaning 
not the complete absence, but a lesser amount of vagal activity, meaning higher fight or flight, higher sympathetic, which we know leads to a lot of cardiovascular diseases. And one of the geeky cool things, Alan, is that if you do have a smartwatch that measures HRV, most people's way of interacting with HRV is through exercise, and they'll see improvement by exercise, mm-hmm. which is amazing. But mm-hmm. kind of the thing that makes Jen and I geek out is like how our HRV changes in response to regular application of polyvagal exercises, right? Or how does my HRV respond when I do a somatic practice for a while that increases my felt sense of safety? So working from the inside out, working on your body and your brain's experience of its own Mm -hmm. safety is a really potent method of improving HRV in addition to kind of traditional forms of exercise. Yeah, and I know I was reading this article, I guess back when COVID first came out and they found out that there were people who were asymptomatic, you know, they were first learning, well, people can have COVID and not have any symptoms. There was this one professional basketball player that was wearing an aura ring and he was really on to his, his heart rate variability because that was his recovery me- metric for how hard he could train. And he mm-hmm. wasn't recovering. It was his HRV was too low and it wasn't recovering. And mm-hmm. so he decided that there was something physically wrong with him. They tested him and he had COVID. And uh, mm-hmm. so I, I think that particular team issued every player one of those rings. So this is this is a good tool if you know what you're measuring and why you're measuring. Just because it's low might be your body is fighting off a virus or dealing with something else. There might be some stress mm-hmm. that you're not even fully aware of. Mm-hmm. or a trauma yeah. that you're not fully aware of. And that's where your process, the air process kind of comes in. Because as you got to talking through this, I was like, I would think that I know what I know, but there are things I don't know <laughs> or I don't remember that I've I've probably dealt with in the past and understanding how those affect me mm-hmm. today. Uh, that You've got tools here to help walk us through and figure out some of these things and as a result deal with them uh in the right way can you talk about the air process and how we can use that to uh improve our our health improve our fitness improve everything alan i think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said that there are some things that you remember or maybe don't remember because a lot of the patterns that we're looking to become aware of are subconscious. They're happening below our conscious awareness and all we're getting is heart palpitations, stomach aches, headaches, feeling tired, and we don't know why. So the messages that we are becoming aware of are not just, okay, I have these symptoms that are both in my mind and my body, meaning, you know, thoughts of anxiety or, you know, sadness, fear, and also in my body, like my health. But what is actually beneath the symptoms, what is driving them are patterns of feeling unsafe, like what we were talking about earlier, and patterns of this chronic stress response. And the chronic, you know, you said earlier that a lot of our exercises are body-based. And then you said, and some are mind, but actually what we're achieving when we do the mind ones, I'm doing air quotes right now, (laughs) is a change in your body. We, you know, when we do an exercise that helps you feel settled in, in the space of your mind, that helps you see a different perspective, what that brings about is a feeling of safety, a feeling of, oh, actually, I'm not as afraid anymore, or I'm not as worried as I was. So going back to the air approach, step number one is awareness, right? Without awareness, we don't know what we're looking at. We don't know what we're changing. And the awareness is of those initially unconscious patterns that are running beneath our conscious awareness that are running the coping mechanisms that we're using, like perfectionism, people-pleasing, high-achieving, anxiety, depression, addiction, so on and so forth. And all of these, over time, create stress and then create symptoms in the body. 
So number one is awareness. Step number two is interruption. Once you have the awareness of these patterns, okay, I am, am aware of these messages coming from my body telling me that I feel a lot of stress when I have to, uh, for example, go for a job interview, as you said, or when I have to answer a phone call from my father, I feel stress. So that awareness of when do these messages become louder and in what form are they? So when we talk about the messages coming from the body, we talk about thoughts, what happens in your mind, sensations, what sense it do you, are, do your fingers tingle? Do you feel a gripping in your shoulders or your muscles tight? I was a professional ballet dancer. And as an athlete, for many years, I experienced anxiety and st stress, Alan, and with a history of trauma. And I was injured all the time. And as somebody who was then went off to study physio and was a very personal trainer, Pilates, um, you know, a coach, a performance coach, I was always looking at my performance, like, what am I doing wrong? Why are other people not getting injured? Why am I always injured? I work so hard. I think I'm resting. I think I'm eating okay. I was so anxious. My nervous system, which also is what contracts and releases, relaxes your muscles, was in overdrive, was depleted, was in a sympathetic fight or flight. And so learning that gave me the opportunity later on when I then developed chronic pain and illness to change the patterns in my muscles through exercises that began with awareness and then moved into interruption. So the interruption step is essentially all about changing tracks. So if you're on a train, you're going from A to B, interruption helps you press stop on the train and change tracks and go to C instead of B. So it really creates, and what it does in the brain, our it helps you begin the neuroplastic changes, these new organization in the brain of new thoughts, new feelings, and essentially practicing new habits of thinking and feeling to change the root causes of some of those coping mechanisms that are keeping you stressed and stuck. I've been talking for so long now, so <laughs> perhaps Cardin wants to go into the redesign step and, and talk about other, other sure. parts of air. You know, the whole objective, we, we say this a lot, is your brain doesn't want to change itself. It doesn't want to change itself. It's a habit repetition machine, right? And so, you know, people say I'm stressed out all the time. It does take a modicum of awareness and interruption and redesign to actually get that brain of yours to do something different. And so the redesign step that Jen just alluded to is now we want your brain to prefer track C to track B. And as some of your listeners might have heard before, it takes about 60 to 90 days to create habit change. That's another way of saying it takes 60, 90 days to establish new neural pathways, new neural train tracks that take you to a different response and outcome in your own body. And so if you get into the habit of noticing, oh my God, I get anxious. I, I feel my heart, I feel my chest contract, my heart rate increase, my belly get uh, nauseous for a job interview. That's your awareness step, well done. Then you use an interruption step um, like switch where you feel the feel your feet on the floor, right? Or you do a VU technique, which activates that vagus nerve, and you very quickly allow your body to go from the heightened state to a more embodied and settled state. And then you could actually reframe the job interview mindset-wise, right? Writing down like, what am I afraid of? Addressing those fears, making yourself feel safe again in mind. And then actually allowing yourself, and we have these practices in the book, to feel what it's like to think about the interview and actually feel settled or empowered. And practicing that as if you were an athlete practicing for an, an event, right? Which is normal practice in high, in high performance, right? It's like we think about how we want the race or the game or the, the swim meet to go. And you're training your neurophysiology, your brain and body, 
to arrive at that meet and perform in a certain way. So the redesign step is both taking advantage of how you feel from the interruption, but then making the more effective nervous system state the one that actually feels appropriate and the one that's there for you when you go into the interview. Okay. Could you take us through one or two of the exercises that we we could do to just kind of give us an idea of, of how this works? I have no yeah. idea how to do any of those things, so I'm not going <laughs> So, you know, Alan, how I was talking about the vagus nerve earlier and a tiny bit of the anatomy, and I was talking about how it innervates the ear, the voice box, the pharynx, the sides of your neck. So the simple action of massaging your ear increases the blood flow to the area that innervates the vagus nerve stimulating the action of the vagus nerve and triggering the parasympathetic response. So if you're listening to this now and you have the opportunity to literally massage your earlobe or the ridges of your ear, you will feel after about 30 seconds a sense of a sense of relaxation, a sense of okay. And, and it's not complex, it's physiological. Um, another one is, say, you're, you experience a sense of anxiety. You've noticed in your mind that you have thoughts of anxiety and fear. You've noticed that your hands are sweating. You've become aware that, okay, right now my body is doing anxiety. So you've done the awareness. Now you're going to move to interruption. In interruption, we want to really use the body, use the vagus nerve, use the polyvagal system. And so to discharge anxiety is a buildup of energy that doesn't know where to go. That's why we feel like, what am I going to do with this feeling in my body? If we move our body and we discharge the energy, our muscles do a lot of the work for us, stimulating, again, that parasympathetic response. So a really good exercise is to simply stand up and stomp your feet. And the bottom of our feet have millions of nerve endings. And by stimulating the bottom of our feet, as do our hands as well, but we get this message, a somatosensory neuromotor message coming from the bottom of our feet, the soles of our feet, preferably barefoot, all the way up to our brain, that something has changed. The switching step is really about switching our brain's focus from fear to organizing the messages that are coming up. So if you're moving, all of a sudden your brain is like, whoa, 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 okay, I'm getting sensation of cold floor and my muscles are jiggling and I feel tingling in my shoulders. So the brain is a very intelligent machine, but it is also a very basic machine in that when you give it new information, it's like, what's that shiny object over there? So that's what this somatosensory neuromotor exercise does in sort of interrupting and switching those tracks from the fear, stress to a sense of reorganization and safety. Jen, Jen just inspired me. So I, I want to jump in and for uh, to see how those all go together in a nice air process that can really help you in a situation. So let, let's say you do get triggered by that job interview or you get an email that's just really uh, activating and really worrying. So first thing is you just have the awareness to being like, whoa, I just got really stressed out. Right. And then you do and you feel all that energy, that anxious energy, and you do a first interruption step, which would be what Jen just described. Like before you do anything else, get up, start stomping your feet, allow the sympathetic energy of that animal survival body to process, because the moment we can discharge some of that energy, the sooner we can actually get the newer, more regulating parts of our brain back online. Then a really delicious thing to do, and it is, is to do that ear that ear massage from top of the ear to the bottom, do it five to 10 times. And so now we've discharged survival energy and now we've done a vagus stimulating exercise that brings us more back into the window of tolerance. That initial fear response has softened. And then I'm gonna add one, which is you can do something that we call the three circles exercise. And so the first circle is the description of What's the response that I'm having to this email right now? It could be fear. I'm going to lose my job. They're mad at me. I'm doomed, right? You can see all of the mental context that's adding stress. 
in the next circle, so the first circle we call the story, by the way, the next circle we do what happened, what's actually happening. Like this is the most basic. What's happening is I got an email. There is a problem to solve. I need to respond to it within the next three or four hours. Because you've done the discharge technique, the, the awareness and interruption techniques, and then the settling one of the ears, you have more of your mind and body online to address this problem in a way that's effective. And by seeing the story, you're like, whoa, look at all this stuff that I'm adding to this situation. The what's happening makes it really simple. And then the third circle is what would be a better way to take this on, right? Which is like, I'm competent. I'm in intelligence. I've solved these problems before. These are the three steps to solving the problem. I'm going to write the email. And that's a completely different way of engaging with the stressor that typically would cause you to maybe lose two nights of sleep. And that's how understanding the secret language of the body and how to work with your nervous system can really change your life. Well, thank you for that. So I'm going to ask both of you the same question. I ask this on all my podcasts, but I'm going to ask each of you the question, let you have your own three. Um, I'll start with you, Cardin. I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Mm, terrific. First one is, uh, you said fittest, healthiest, and happiest, right? <laughs> yes. And so I'm going to say, check in with your body about if it agrees that what you think your health is fittest and happiest is what it thinks is its healthiest, fittest, and happiness. And what I mean by that is it's good to do a check-in now and then being like, is this thing really, when I think about maybe running that marathon, is that my mind an achievement-based mind exclusively generating that outcome for me? Or does my body feel good doing that? And simply closing your eyes, tuning into your body and thinking about doing it, if you feel like contraction in your heart and dread in your belly, there's a good chance that what you think is your healthiest, fittest, and happiness is actually out of alignment with other parts of yourself that are repressing that may want actually more relax, more relaxation, more pleasure. They still want to exercise, but not in that kind of draconian form. So that's one thing. I'm really going to say is a check in with your body about whether you think your current goals are what's best for you. Two is to emphasize something that I call energy in instead of energy out. Again, going back to exercise, exercise is phenomenal and necessary, but it is an energy expenditure. What are you doing on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis that's truly energy in? Whether that's receiving massage, or acupuncture, right? Whether it's going to a yin yoga class, right? Or going to a breathwork workshop where you're filling your cup instead of always emptying it in sorts of pursuits of these things that are healthiest, fittest, and happiest. And then, you know, earlier in the podcast, we I said that for a lot of us, that vagus nerve atrophies. And so our access to the parasympathetic state uh, atrophies. I've realized very recently you know, I have a six and a three-year-old. I run multiple small businesses. I'm very ambitious. That when people ask me, like, what are your hobbies? Or like, what makes you happy? I have this like fog in my head. I'm like, what are you talking about? Hobbies, happiness. I'm, I frequently feel satisfied, satisfied with my family, satisfied with my work. But like, do I remember what it felt like to be excited about something? Like when I was in my teens or my 20s. Do I remember what the felt experience of just happiness is? Do I remember that juicy feeling of looking forward to something and then wanting to share it with everyone? I've realized in my own mind and body that those neural pathways and sensations of like just pleasure and joy and happiness have atrophied because I haven't used them much in 20 years. And so... I think it's also when we talk about happiness, when you're checking off the boxes of your fitness or your life goals, are you actually feeling effing happy? Do you know what that feels like? And my invitation is to rediscover it. And ways to rediscover it are to tune into your body and sink into detailed, visually sensory rich memories of when you felt it when you were a kid, reviving them that way. Also, 
trying to tap into the hobbies that did bring you pleasure when you were a child. So I recently got uh, an Estes rocket kit because I loved putting together rockets. And playing with a rocketry kit again made me feel that childhood joy. And I want more of that in my life. Those are my three, Alan. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jennifer, your turn. I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Thank you. And thanks, Cardin, for sharing that. All very useful and important. We have one of them in common. When I got sick, Alan, people would stop me and and tell me, like, how do you do it all? Like, you're such, you're such a you're superhuman. Like, I had clients before university, after university, I was class president, I was physio rep for the NHS. Like, I was just all over the place. I wasn't sleeping. I was working out like six and a half days a week. Ridiculous. I got all, I don't know what the grading system is again in the US, but it was like all A star, A plus, like a straight A student. And if you ask me, like, was I healthy? I, I thought I was super healthy. I was like, yeah, I work out six days a week. I'm super fit. I've got all my, you know, like I, I'm giving all of this super stimulating information to my clients and I'm learning all day at university. I think my brain is healthy. My body's healthy. My nutrition was, uh, you know, quite balanced, but boy, was I stressed <laughs> and burnt out and not aligned. I was pushing myself. I was moving through life, worried about what other people would think of me, worried if what I would say was enough, worried about, you know, that's why we are high achievers, because we want to prove ourselves to those around us. And like, I'm worthy. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of being here. Look at me. Look at what I've achieved. I'm a high achiever. I'm a I'm a business owner. I do this and I have so many clients. So, you know, that sort of unworthiness was really, really eating at me inside. So the most important thing that I learned when I started to get well again was learning to be me, unapologetically me and not in like a cliche way, like, yeah, like be unapologetic. No, I'm dead serious. Like, how can I wake up today and look at that person and who's asked me something and I really want to say no, but I usually say yes. You know, that yes costs me half of my day, half of my energy. I'm already tired after I've said yes. So really learning, using the tools that, you know, from journaling to um, more mindful forms of exercise like Qigong and Tai Chi and yin yoga forms of therapy, body-based and mind-based that help you connect to the power of being you and ultimately say no when you want to say no, speak up when you want to speak up and share your opinion, which matters and is valued. And if you feel safe as being you in the world, a lot of things, a lot of choices and actions align with your life and there's less stress because relationships begin to align, your friendships align. You know, if we we, we all have some friends that we care about, but like, oh, do I have to see them again this week? Or I'm like, oh my God, they're coming over for lunch. Like, I'm so tired. But you know, if you know that saying no, it changes is it changes everything for the energy of your of your week. So, number one, learning using the tools to learn to be you, and the one that I have in common with Cardin is joy. Have you done? So, Alan, what's one thing today that you've done? I think it's still morning where you are, but yes, it is. so far, what is one thing that you've done that has brought you joy? Well, I have dogs. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have two dogs and I make a point mm -hmm. every morning to let mm -hmm. those dogs know how much I care about them. I don't Aww. know that they know that, know that, but I know sure that I, know. I know that I told them. So yeah, my dogs. Oh, I love that. Well, so recognizing the things that we're doing in our day that can allow us to, to really be present and be with our children, our pets or a hobby or read a book. Like I started reading Cardin bought a, a, a rocket kit and I started reading again, right? Because we wrote a book. So I haven't picked up a book in like a year because I was like, I don't want to look at words ever again. And we recreated our program. And I 
like I've been inhaling fantasy books again and I'm obsessed. I love it. Like I can't wait to for my son to fall asleep so I can read and like go to another world. And that really helps, right? The imagination, creativity, even if you're not an artist, play, creativity, painting, like just exploring things that help your brain move out of its regular patterns. And then the last thing um, is meeting your basic needs. This is something that has come up a lot for me in the in the recent month, I would say. And I think I'm going to keep talking about it because when I do, people seem to be like, oh yeah, you're right. Like meeting your basic needs have, you know, how many times is it mid-morning and you haven't had any water, you haven't had, you know, you're hungry, maybe you haven't even peed and you've been holding your pee for an hour or the, what are the basic needs that I haven't been meeting that if I met, my nervous system would be like, oh, thank God she gave me some food or thank goodness I we have some water now so we can move better again. Um, and then, of course, exercise and sleep, like moving your body. You move your body, you heal your body. You move the lymph, you heal your, you know, you, you heal your mind and your body. So that's my third one. And I think the combo of being you, play, joy, creativity, and meeting your needs is essential for, in my perspective. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, I want to thank both of you uh, for being on the show. But uh, if someone wanted to learn more about you and the secret language of the body, where would you like for me to send them? You can go anywhere you want. Uh, wherever books are sold, you can find the secret language of the body. And as for our programs, Jen... Yeah, for our programs, you can go on social media. So Mia International is our Instagram handle or www.somiainternational.com. And then our personal Instagram handles where we share a lot of what we shared with you as well today and uh, all the healing tips um, that you'll find through So Mia. Yeah, well, and that's at Cardin Rabin and uh, at I am Jen Manan, right? Mm-hmm. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 650, and I'll be sure to have the links there as well. Uh, Jennifer Cardin, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you so much. It for was a pleasure. Us. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Alan. I love this discussion. You know, I love anything having to do with the mind and mindset and good attitudes and everything. But right at the beginning, you were discussing with them, you know, how we talk to our bodies, how we feed our bodies really does have an impact on our health and in learning how to communicate to our body in a better way could really make all the difference in how we live. It can. Uh, you know, a, a body that doesn't feel safe is not going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. It's not going to build significant muscle. It's just not going to perform the way you mm -hmm. want it to because your body okay. is trying to keep you alive. Uh, mm -hmm. All of these systems and the ways this is all working is really just keep you alive. And, you know, our bodies weren't designed for 24 seven news. They weren't designed oh for social gosh. media, you know, so we true. yeah, you know, or bosses that can reach you anytime, anywhere, uh, true. through a little box you carry around. Our bodies weren't designed for that kind of thing, you know? And, and so if the worst thing you had to worry about was, was a lion eating your family, but the, your whole tribe's there. So the lions are going to stay away. It's a pretty chill place <laughs> you know, yes. as long as you're getting good quality food and you're moving, which mm -hmm. you are, if you're getting good quality food. So, what we have to realize is that what we tell our body through our food, our movement, what we're, how we're sleeping, you know, our stress level, and then yes, well, how we talk to ourselves, all of those are inputs into this system and the system through the, um, the vagus nerve and, and all that stuff literally is how all your hormones and everything work. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in a stressed environment and you're not managing that stress, mm -hmm. you're, you're really setting up for illness. Oh, for sure. You know, you and I've talked about this a lot lately, you know, on our podcast and, and I talk about it with my athletes too, is that we are our biggest critic, you know, all day long, we are telling ourselves we're not strong enough. We're not fast enough. We're not eating the right things. We feel guilty for the things we're eating when, you know, we should be doing something different. We're, we're not active enough. We're not going to the gym enough. You know, we just pile on all these things to ourselves. And over time, it really does have a physical impact. And part of their book was this acronym AIR, Awareness, Interruption, and Redesign. I think the first one, awareness, is a huge uh, thing for us to really 
figure out, you know, to be aware of these thoughts that we're telling ourselves and taking note when our bodies are feeling pretty awful, like what is actually going on? I mean, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times we think that there's something else, you know, we're, we feel fatigue or energy levels low, our hair's falling out or, <laughs> yes. you know, just different stuff is going on. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, well, okay, I, I must have some dire illness. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes, yeah, it's, it's literally self-inflicted stuff <laughs> because you're telling you're, you're, you're being unfair to yourself. You're saying things to yourself you wouldn't say to your best friend. Mm-hmm. And so it's, yes, if you catch yourself, you know, and, and, and words, I, I've done an episode on this and it, things I would say is if you, if you're in your head and you, you're saying words like never or always, mm-hmm. that's that, that's that voice <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because you know, yeah. it's not true. I mean, you know, you're not always losing your keys. Mm-hmm. You may lose them <laughs> yes. more often than you wanted to, but you yep. don't always lose your keys. Oh, and you're not an idiot for losing your keys, right. you know, just, you know, but that's the words, the words they're mm-hmm. there and they just come out and like, you idiot, what, what, you're always <laughs> losing your keys, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so now, now you're triggered, your stress mm-hmm. levels are a lot higher. Mm-hmm. And the reality of it is if you get that awareness and you interrupt it for a second, you realize, okay, I just need, I can't think in this situation. Right. And, and okay, so an example I have from my personal life, uh, we were going on a family trip and I had forgotten that when, when you're traveling to Australia, even though they'll give you a visa as an American mm-hmm. with little or no trouble, you mm-hmm. do have to do that application online first oh. before they'll let you on the plane. So when we arrived at the airport, there were five of us or six, five, yeah, five of us that needed to go get, the, get done each individually. Oh boy. And I'm sitting there on my phone. I don't do anything on my phone. I always use a laptop. Mm-hmm. So, but they didn't have Wi Fi in that part of the airport. Oh. So I'm literally like, okay, how am I going to go online and do this? And I just, I started, I started, you, you, were, you should have remembered this. You should, you know, oh. the words, the, and all that did was just lift up my Paris, I mean, just put me on fire. Yep. And, yeah. and I, and that actually impacted my ability to actually do the forms, you know, like, yeah. I needed to do the forms quickly so we can make the flight. But at the same time, my internal being was, was making it extremely difficult for me to accomplish that. And mm-hmm. so that's why I'd say is like, as you, as you start going into this, you know, that awareness in that moment, mm-hmm. I'm standing there in a terminal, like just losing my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, again, I didn't have the tools. Uh, right. This book has the tools to walk mm-hmm. through this process of the awareness. Okay. Interrupt mm-hmm. it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then redesign that situation. Mm-hmm. And so I just needed to take a deep breath mm-hmm. and I just needed to start working on them. Right. Absolutely. You know? And, and so that was the solution. And I, but I, and I had to get past myself. I had to calm mm-hmm. myself down Mm-hmm. Um, and basically tell my inner voice to shut the hell up. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do that once in a while. Absolutely. Yep. And I like some of the tips that they had discussed too. The rubbing of the ear, I, apparently that triggers that n- vagus nerve yeah. pathway. Okay. That's simple, innocuous. Getting up and stomping on the ground. I, there's a lot of nerves in our feet then that could have a reaction or at least start the process. But it's, yeah, it's that moment where you're aware that something is not right and your heart rate's going up, you're getting upset, you're getting nervous. And then just to take that minute to do a physical activity, to stop the motion, and then to think yourself through it. What can you do differently to get through this yeah. and make you feel safer? And one of the things I thought was really cool, and that's why I wanted to get into it, was if you have one of those smart watches or one of those rings mm-hmm. that measures heart rate variability, mm-hmm. you'll probably be able to f- see these things happen almost in real time mm-hmm. because your heart rate va- variability will drop. It'll drop mm-hmm. dramatically when these things are happening. And I just think that's a pretty cool way to use, for, cool reason to, to use the watch because oh, it's, it's giving you data that's like, okay, dude, you're, you're on tilt. Chill. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes I think what stresses us out is not always at the forefront of our brain where we could put it into words. Not too long ago, my husband had a really long business trip. He had to go overseas, which is a two week trip. I'm used to him being gone for a week at a time, five to seven days at a time, but this was a really long trip. 
by the middle of his trip, you know, seven or 10 days into it, I'm not sleeping at night. Um, My hot flashes are back with a vengeance. I'm just feeling just terrible, probably from lack of sleep. (laughs) And it, and it dawned on me. It's like, I don't ever sleep well when he's gone, but I said those words out well out loud. I'm like, okay, that's not true. You know, I had to work myself through that feeling like the always and never kind of situation. You know, I had to like, okay, I'm used to him being gone. I know what I need to do. And so having these things, I will get back to my yoga practice and I run all the time. I'll go on walks because that's peaceful and I can be outside and find joy in being outside in the woods and whatnot. So, you know, it's just sometimes it's not always obvious. Sometimes you get the feeling and then you got to address the feeling just as much. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. I love these tips. This sounds like a great book. It is. It's a re- it's a really good book, and it's it, it comes an audio book. But I, this is one that I would encourage you to just go ahead and get the the actual book because that, like I said, it's it's something that you would you probably want as a reference as you go forward because this is Absolutely. this is going to help a lot of people. Oh, that sounds great! Thanks so much. All right. Well, um, I'll talk to you next week. Take care, Alan. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. If you enjoyed today's show, take a moment to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And if you would, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss how to design your perfect running program after 40. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.